Have we still got people joining, Rob? Or... There's a few people joining still. Right, okay. Well, while the last people are <clears throat> connecting in, um, I just, I'll just uh, give you a welcome. And actually, we just had a welcome from Vancouver. So uh, good morning, Vancouver. I don't know if anyone's uh, from further afield, whether we should have a competition. Um, but it's great to see people coming from, oh, Chicago. It's going to get competitive now. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll stop this before we get, oh, Michigan, OK. Uh, Sheffield quality that's all I'm going to say um anyway I'm not going to pursue this one because we could go all evening um so well well welcome to you all for from near or far um and thanks for joining us for the third in the current uh, series of lectures from the Society of, uh, for Church Archaeology um I'm very glad to welcome you as the chair um uh, just to give you a couple of words of housekeeping etiquette, um, if you haven't joined us before. Um, if you could please make sure your microphones are switched off, just in case you get that, that urgent call or the dog barks or whatever. Um, um, so if you make sure you're on mute and you can do that at just at the bottom left of the screen, but I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with that procedure. Um, when our speaker, who I'll introduce in the moment, is talking, feel free to think of exciting, interesting, probing, difficult questions. Um, but uh, the way we organize this is if you put your question into the chat box, um, and then at the end, Rob, who's sort of coordinating all the difficult uh, sort of technological side of this, will then read out the questions to Jackie, and that way we can sort of uh, get, hopefully get through them all um, in, a, in a timely manner. So that's how we will run things. Um, as most of you hopefully know, um, our society is here to promote the study of the church, the, particularly the archaeology of the church and sort of topics related to the church. So, um, you know, if you aren't a member but feel like finding out more about our society, please visit the web page and you can find out about all our activities and uh, publications and that sort of thing. So we would encourage you to, to join the society. Um, but, you know, whether you're a member or not, uh, we hope you enjoy our lectures. Um, it makes it worthwhile for our part, knowing that we have so many people, you know, tuning in and hopefully finding them entertaining and educational. So now I've done the, you know, the obligatory plug, um, I will sort of introduce our speaker, who I suspect is known to many of you. Um, Tonight we have uh, Jackie Hall speaking. Um, now Jackie is a consultant archeologist, but uh, particularly pertinent to the talk she's giving tonight. She is the cathedral archeologist for two of our finest cathedrals, uh, which probably if you place them end to end would just about block the Suez Canal um, or not. So I'm not quite sure about that one. Probably not quite actually, um, but uh, she is the cathedral archeologist for, for Peterborough and Southwark. So I imagine she's going to be drawing on her extensive experience of what that entails in her talk tonight. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Jackie and she will present her, her talk to us tonight. Let's see. Um, has that worked? Nope. Can anyone see my screen? Yep, that's worked, Jackie. That's good. Okay, cool. Thanks, Hugh, uh, for the introduction. Um, okay, uh, Hugh has ably introduced who I am and the clues in the title as well, so you know what the talk's going to be about as well. So don't expect any surprises. Um, I've got two apologies, really, in advance. One is for... Um, uh, 
the unwisely, given it's a Society for Church Archaeology, foolishly agreeing to choose April Fool's Day, not because uh, it's April Fool's Day, but because it's Maundy Thursday and many of you will have other things to do in other places. Um, and secondly, um, I'll apologise in advance because uh, I don't know who you all are, though I definitely recognise some friends out there. Um, and, and I don't know the, the level of your, your knowledge on this subject. Some of you all know more than me, and some of you I will be um, definitely not covering the subject in enough detail, and others I'll just be swimming, swimming sliding across the top. And, um, and there's a danger I'll be telling you what you know or not telling you enough. But um, just before getting into the, the wonderful nitty gritty uh, of the, this wonderful subject, um, I thought I'd just uh, cover why, why there are cathedral archeologists. Uh, you know, um, before the care of cathedrals measure in 1990, it was very much a voluntary uh, thing. Um, there, some of the cathedrals did take on archeological advisors, but it was essentially voluntary and, and rather patchy. And so the, there was pressure to bring cathedrals for the first time in their history under a degree of national control, uh, which was derived from a review of the so-called ecclesiastical exemption uh, by the then Department of the Environment. And they were given the choice of either accepting control of their historic fabric by a national church body or coming under listed building control uh, by the local authority. And all except Oxford opted for the former, uh, the result being the care of cathedrals measure. And the aim of this was to create a consolidated system that replicated the controls over secular buildings imposed in both the historic buildings and ancient monuments legislation. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this, especially if you're involved uh, in either parish churches or other church buildings within the ecclesiastical exemption. Um, so the appointment of a cathedral archaeological consultant became mandatory from that point. And while it was up to individual chapters to, to decide who they would appoint, they could only appoint someone whose archaeological credentials were recognised as appropriate by the Cathedral's Fabric uh, Commission for England, uh, the new body from that point. So since then, the measure has been revised on a number of occasions, most significantly drawn together in 2011. But the treatment of archaeology has essentially remained the same, with cathedral archaeologists having the same roles uh, and the archaeology having the same importance. Fundamentally, this means that archaeology is considered to be above ground as well as below ground. Uh, I think this is especially good since I'm primarily a buildings archaeologist. Um, and there's a a, there's the importance is stressed of preserving the archaeological evidence from unnecessary destruction. And this it makes us very much uh, curatorial archaeologists, as, as well as sort of acting ones, if you like, as well as digging ones, uh, which is similar to the role, say, of county archaeologists or similar or positions within historic England. And then if uh, destruction is unavoidable, then we have the responsibility for recording or arranging to record and publish uh, all the evidence and permission has to be given uh, for such work at a national, uh, for the destruction, I mean, at a national level. So um, you, I should point out for, uh, who they, for those of us who think we spend our time swanning around having wonderful time paid for all year round. It, these are not jobs as such. Uh, in, in general, cathedrals will just pay for a few days of our, our year um, uh, and th the rest is by a, pro a per project basis. So um, you're already grasped, so I, I help look after two cathedrals. And so I've been the cathedral archeologist at, at Peterborough um, since 2005. Um, and at Southwark only since 2016. Uh, for me, they provide a, a set of really delightful contrasts. Um, and although they both have their origins in, in medieval religious houses. So Peterborough is a uh, major, or was, I should say, a, a major Benedictine monastery, one of the richest in the country. Um, at whereas Southwark was an Augustinian priory 
uh, from the early 12th century, although there's a, a slight chance that it may also, like Peterborough, have had Anglo-Saxon origins. Um, archaeologically, and I'm speaking below ground here uh, rather than above, um, archaeologically, they're, they're also rather different below ground. So um, on the left hand side, um, that, that's a, a antiquarian drawing of the head of stone. And it, at Peaceborough, it's all about the Anglo-Saxons, uh, whether from the uh, 7th century the, or, or the refoundation in the 10th. And uh, there's a lot of remains and quite a lot of loose stone as well. Whereas at Southwark uh, Cathedral, just like the rest of Southwark, it's all about the Romans. If you dig deep enough, you'll find them. Um, here is a, a, the pictures of a couple of sculptures found at the bottom of a, a well, um, at, at actually within the cathedral itself. But there are also traces of roads and other um, and other structures. Uh, in the few times that it's been possible to, to dig that deep. Architecturally, they're also different. At Peterborough, it's, it's mainly Romanesque and on quite a massive scale. Uh, that's just lo um, looking at the church rather than more widely. Um, whereas at uh, Southwark here shown on the left, uh, it's all about, it's all mainly early Gothic on a much smaller scale and actually really rather dainty and lovely. Peterborough is set within this huge historic precincts, um, largely still intact, though not all within the ownership of the, the uh, church anymore. Um, and with a really tiny medieval town that didn't grow even to its present state uh, size until after the coming of the railways. Well, you could hardly get more different. Um, Southwark, uh, the Priory of St Mary Overy, uh, only had small precincts even when they were visible. Now it's a tiny churchyard sort of nestled within the sort of massive infrastructure of the uh, of London. Um, you know, once in the suburbs of London, on um, still you know close by the London Bridge, which it still is. Um, now really close to the heart of of this metropolis. And in their post-medieval history is also very different. Uh, Peterborough became a cathedral uh, almost as soon as it had been dissolved, whereas uh, the, the Priory of St Mary Overy became a parish church and uh, only upgraded to being a cathedral in 1905. So this is a, a sort of series of, uh, of contrasts of full of, I, no doubt, of oversimplifications, but I hope it gives some idea of the variety there is in, in cathedral archeology, span even only looking at, at these two cathedrals for which I have some duty. And occasionally I have the opportunity to undertake research and recording as part of larger projects, uh, which can really contribute to our understanding of these places. So I, I'm going to now indulge in sort of further sort of cathedral porn and the, the wonderful touristy op opportunities there are. So I can really recommend visiting them both, of course, as soon as you feel it's safe to do so and they're completely open again. Um, and you hear here are some wonderful features. The east end of Peaceborough, um, it, one of the last great rebuildings of, of the uh, post-conquest period with a massively lengthy uh, building program that lasted over a century, but retained its sort of core um, architectural, Romanesque architectural style right until right to the uh, west end of the nave until it, it sort of went bananas in, the, in this sort of crazy early and unique early English um, a Gothic West Front, whereas, an, and then much later, this rather stunning addition, the so-called new building of the early 16th century at the East End. Uh, and, you know, I, I can't, it, and it, it was built for Abbot Robert Kirkton and the architect was John Mostel. And really famously, of course, the, the architect, uh, the designer of, of King's College Chapel, Cambridge. And really, I can't recommend visiting this highly enough as an alternative because it's free, though I 
sure the, the cathedral would be very grateful if, if, if you gave a donation. Um, it's uh, relatively empty by comparison. And I think for me, more than anything, it's really rather intimate. It's not a towering uh, building. You can see these amazingly intricate fan vaults really quite close up and get to study their sort of beauty at a, uh, this intimate level. And then of course, uh, there's the, this is just a hat four of lots and lots and lots of, uh, of former monastic buildings in the extensive precincts. The Norman Gateway, a part of Hostry Passage, a part of the cloister, and on the left-hand side, uh, a 13th century infirmary, which has been turned inside out with um, houses now in the aisles, a little bit like at Ely. And then beyond those, uh, uh, two at least of the, the medieval halls that that cluster around the south side of the precincts. Um, all rather wonderful, I think. And, um, and now returning to, to Southwark, uh, the, my favorite part of it, which is the retro choir, a bit like at Peterborough, retro choir is always the best, clearly. Uh, but also, as it happens, I think one of the most important surviving Gothic buildings in London, um, you know, uh, certainly on a par with, uh, with Temple Church, um the the choir it, it's sort of uh a, in between chronologically in between the nave and the choir of the temple uh, and although this is in some many ways the product of, of restoration in the 1820s it really retains it, its medieval bones and quite a lot of medieval material and here's a rather silly picture showing some of the earlier 12th century apps with me looking up at it from this, so the, the so-called archaeological chamber, which was retained after the, uh, some excavations and building for the, um, for the Millennium Project. And uh, just a, a, a rather lovely post-medieval feature, which is the late 17th century chandelier, which was a gift uh, to the parish church at the time. It's still in regular use and it comes down a few times a year. Uh, to, uh, to be um, for, for candles to be lit but this is when it was being put up after the rehanging of the bells and the two vergers are um, standing there they're looking a bit bemused but they really do know what they're doing and you can see it all laid out really carefully and in the ceiling um, designed by George Pace there's the reuse of um, a, a selection of a rather wonderful set of carved uh, late 15th century bosses so that's the end of the, the tourism bit. Um, so, but I hope it encourages you to go and visit because it's so worth it. And, and there's a lot of complexity uh, to unravel for those so minded. So now I want to turn and to look in, in a little bit of detail at just a few of the projects that have taken place in recent years at Southwark and Peterborough. For Southwark, I've chosen the one really major project that's taken place since I started which is namely repairs to the East End. And at Peterborough, I've chosen a little bit of work that I've recently undertaken for the Corpus of, of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture. And if you've um, heard a little bit of this before, I apologise profusely. Um, but hey, you know, there will be new things for everyone somewhere. And at the very end, I just want to pick up on one, what looked like it was going to be a very minor uh, watching brief that took place in uh, January this year at Southwark that actually turned out to be rather significant. So first, looking at Southwark first then. So major repairs took place on the East End between 2017 and 2019, mainly replacements of the copper roof covering, but also fairly significant masonry repairs on the exterior. So it was all above ground um, and fairly recent, as we shall see. For me, firstly, it was a great opportunity to understand the building history, both through archival research uh, and new recording from the scaffolding. Secondly, working closely with the architect Kelly Christ, it was an opportunity to contribute to the best possible conservation outcome through our joint work on developing a stone policy and implementing that in the repair project. I've already mentioned the interior of the retro choir and the choir of 
finer early Gothic architecture. Uh, yes, um, probably erected shortly after the fire of 1212, which destroyed so many buildings in Southwark. Um, as we shall see, uh, as we see in the interior today, it's subject of considerable restoration, particularly in the higher levels, uh, carried out under the auspices of local architect and antiquarian George Gwilt Jr. And he really is the hero of this church building. George Gwilt's work took place in two major phases um, after a plan to demolish the entire church had been abandoned, fortunately. The choir in 1822 to three and the retro choir a decade later. Along the way, parts of the building were lost. So the chapel of Mary Magdalene was taken down in 1822, Mary Magdalene, I should say, um, Cambridge influencer, sorry. Uh, the, the Lady Chapel, the medieval Lady Chapel, which later became known as the, uh, the Bishop's Chapel, uh, was taken down uh, uh, when the London Bridge was moved upstream. Um, and what else are lost? Uh, houses uh, along the south side of, of the choir were also lost at this time. And, and some others actually were lost on the north side as well, but at other periods. Um, immediately, yes, I've got that. So we know that the choir high vaults and the retro choir vaults were completely replaced. Uh, here we go. Um, Gwilt's own notes tell us that the South Side Clearster and Triforum, Triforium were renewed along with the East Side Clearstery. Um, and this is a rather wonderful painting from the British Library collection. And it looks like the workmen are on the ground, but they're not. So this is a working platform that was um, erected at the bottom of the Triforium. So this is the South Triforium here. And I think this is probably all new as it happens. This is the springing of the clearstery here. Um, and it looks completely solid. And I'm sure it's a good place to work. Um, and it, but examination of the interior suggests that all the clearsteries were renewed on both sides, but only the triforium on the south side was replaced. And the roofs, of course, were completely replaced in, and in the choir using cast iron trusses and this is one of their earliest uses in an ecclesiastical context. And it had a copper co covering even at this date. And if this seems like pretty major interventions to save the building, then on the exterior, the restoration was even more pronounced with very little medieval fabric at all surviving. So this is one of Gwilt's marvellous pre-restoration drawings. Uh, uh, this is the south side of the choir. And you can see something of the rather abysmal state it was in with a lot of refacing in brick and on what looks like some plaster work and not very much stone at all. And uh, we can begin to understand why, um, why Gwilt needed to reface it more or less in its entirety. And this is needed because, as, as may, any of you have ever worked in a London will, will know, um, the, um, the choices of, of stonework in, in the medieval period were fairly poor. Uh, Rygate stone, which is a type of, of um, uh, green sand, softish green sand, and coal stone imported from Normandy, uh, were very popular and not really very high quality. Um, they problems were documented from the 15th century and probably known about earlier. The other choice was Kentish rag, uh, which was mainly used walling stone, although it did have a brief period of being carved, though there's very little evidence for that at Southwark. Um, Gwilt um, refers to it as being the stone of the county and thus saying it's, you know, he can't build in this, it's just not suitable. We know from the account, uh, from the minutes that the, um, Nave, uh, the nave was faced in brick in the early 17th century, uh, presumably like uh, this. Um, the the uh, exterior was repaired here, and Gwilt also describes the exterior of the choir as having been repaired by driving nails into the rotten stonework and covering the whole with lath and plaster, possibly in the 18th century. And repairs were always being put off. There's never enough money to go around. Um, but eventually it happened. The work on the tower took place first, then the choir was taken in hand uh, 
as I say, it was a close thing not to demolish the entire church, except for the tower. In 1821, uh, Gwilt wrote, I find the east end of the church to be so exceedingly ruinous and its present state so highly precarious that I consider it prudent to advise you that a single day ought not to be lost in taking it down. This was his report to the vestry. And as we see, mostly, but not entirely, take it down, he did. Um, adjacent to that, though, was his great care in his replacements. So these are some of his sketches uh, of um, details that survived and uh, sketches for new work. He was committed, oh, hang on, there's one more slide before that. And here's a rather lovely, uh, drawing, you can see it better in the drawing than in the flint work adjacent to it, uh, of flat, uh, of um, sort of leaves and flowers in his flint work patterns, which are it's quite unusual with possibly a lily, possibly referring to the dedication to, to Mary. So Gwilt was committed to returning the, the choir to its original 13th century design. And if a fragment survived, he copied it and used it in the restoration. But contrarywise, if later, some later, he also removed later medieval and most post medieval features, replacing them in ones in an early Gothic style. Um, for here, for instance, this is a, as is drawing between the restoration of the choir. So we've already lost the, uh, le the late 15th century east window of the choir, but you can see the east windows, the post medieval and medieval. Uh, windows of the retro choir and the bishop's chapel um, this showing how it was before this is his design draw drawing for how he thought it should be afterwards and indeed this is pretty much how it looks today um, and how was this perceived at the time rather well in uh, William Taylor's rather whimsical account of the Priory of St Mary Overy, he describes Gwilt's work as one of the finest restorations in the kingdom, uh, a view that's repeated in works on Southwark uh, throughout the 19th century. And this is, and despite predating really either the Oxford movement or um, uh, Pugin, Pugin's work, this is very much a, of a piece of 19th century philosophy of restoration. The building should all be a cohesive whole and clearly of one specific period, a medieval period, with no distracting elements of a different style. And although he made some changes in the design, he kept as much of the medieval fabric as he could. Viewed from now, arguably rather more than half of the retro choir and choir belong to Gwilt rather than to the medieval builders including almost all of the exterior uh, facing with the exception of parts of the flying buttresses. So for, uh, for Kelly and I then, uh, back in 2017, the question was, what were we conserving? A medieval building or a 19th century one? Especially given its, let's face it, Victorian appearance, even though it predates uh, Queen Victoria. Um, and, and as it, Notably, especially on the exterior, Gwilt did not use the materials used by the medieval buildings, builders. We've already discussed why he couldn't use the medieval stone, but um, replacing it all in ashlar would also have cost too much money. And so instead he used flint and sandstone. And we should remember at this time, there was a beginning to be a choice, an enormous choice of stones coming by canal into London. And in his uh, unpublished notes, he says, the use of land flints for the outside has been admired by many and objected to by a few, but it was an expedient resorted to as a substitute for brickwork to which I would otherwise have been compelled to adopt. It was an experiment. And although it cannot be said to have not failed, it would have succeeded better if browner flints had been selected so as to form a less contrast with the richer tone of masonry in other parts sorry, in other parts, these flints are bound in, in Surrey upon the high ground. So, uh, and, and what we have here, what we, this comment was made in between the, re, the choir being finished and his work on, on the retro choir. And so the, the choir on the left, you can see you've got these very sort of silvery flints in a, 
a sort of rich yellow um, stonework. And so you can tell that he made this effort um, to, to choose browner flints for his later work on the retro choir, though unfortunately the stone that was coming from the quarries that he'd chosen was then paler, so he still has this massive contrast between flints and, uh, and stonework. And he doesn't comment on either the stone type or, and, and it's not mentioned, the Ashler stone that is, and that's not mentioned in the restoration minutes either. But we have a clue in his proposal to rebuild the nave in 1826, which was not accepted, where he says he wishes to use materials of nearly the same quality as the works of the choir, including for the piers, that is the piers of the nave he never built, a hard and durable Bramley full, full stone. Um, the name Bramley Fall is now used only for particular quarries using gritstone to the northeast of Leeds. But in the late 18th and 19th century, the term was widely used to describe the sandstones produced by several other quarries in the rough rock outcrop of the area. So, and this was borne out by what we could see in the choir and the retro choir from the ground, i.e. that uh, it was principally a sandstone. And, uh, and this started our search for the for the right stones to use, um, i.e. Uh, West Yorkshire was our starting point. Uh, and the, the, our underlying premise was that on the exterior, this was essentially Gwilt's building and that we shouldn't try to uh, pretend it was a medieval building on the exterior. And really with the sole exception of um, some of the flying buttresses, uh, some of the material in the flying buttresses, uh, which are where there's a great deal of medieval white uh, Kentish rag, um, there was some post-medieval Portland as well. Um, you know, it, it was all of Gwilt's or later period. So, uh, and it, going along with um, current best practice in terms of developing stone policies, uh, we should we were aiming to match our new the new stone that was required to the building, also taking account of petrology porosity, permeability, uh, compression. And as you've seen, research took place on both archival and geological fronts, but um, both of those tended to identify the stone as a West Yorkshire sandstone, uh, almost certainly from the coal measures. We got together with Dr. Judith Bunbury from Cambridge University, who confirmed our initial observations, uh, who are also undertaking thin section, uh, thin sample analysis for us, um, and uh, giving us access to the wonderful John Watson Building Stone Collection, uh, held a resource held at the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge, which gathered together, uh, was collected by John Watson from uh, at quarries open in the last decades of the 19th century. Um, um, and you can see that it, we, it was a great way of comparing uh, all uh, a number of samples. However, samples taken prior to 1905 are not necessarily available now. So we had to, we headed back to site with uh, samples from open quarries, finally choosing Woodkirk Buff. And there's some of the new stone carved for the higher level string course. On the scaffolding, from, however, it turned out that there was rather more to the East End uh, than we could tell from the ground. Gwilt's exterior itself had been extensively restored. Despite, and it turned out a number of different stone types had been used. Uh, there was the unidentified oolitic limestone, that's the dark orange, um, which I now fairly sure is Ancaster and a match for the stone, uh, Blomfield stone, when he rebuilt the nave uh, prior to it becoming a cathedral. So in the later years, of, the latter years of the 19th century. There's newly cut Kentish rag, along with fresh Portland stone. Um, that's the whitish stone, um, uh, though some of that's medieval as well. Now that particular mixture of stone is used in the early 20th century in the, Harvard, in the east end of the Harvard Chapel. Um, so that was blown by Blomfield's, Blomfield's sons. So I suspect again, that's where repairs were being undertaken there. We have some um, in yellow, some new sandstone. We have, especially on the pinnacles, uh, reconstituted stone, mainly cement, and 
slightly surprisingly magnesium limestone, but uh, that was the choice of uh, probably Ronald Sims in the 1980s. And then we have Klimsham limestone uh, from Lincolnshire um, being used uh, for spot repairs on the East End at the same, probably at the same time as the, the new Millennium buildings were being built not very long ago. Um, and also Blackstone sandstone more recently than that, which is a, a decent attempt to, to match the Gwilt's original stone. There's further to go with developing a stone policy for other areas of the church, but we really do have a better understanding of both Gwilt's work and, and how to repair it, and a better understanding of the multiple repair fa phases that followed. All right, now I want to turn to something completely different uh, at Peterborough, uh, also stones. I'm really quite keen on stones. Um, so recently, and a few years ago now, I undertook some preliminary research for the Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture, uh, which was aimed at identifying all the early sculpture and architectural stones in the cathedral uh, to add to uh, Professor Rosemary Cramp's uh, official list for inclusion in the corpus. Unlike other approaches, uh, which started quite reasonably from the stones themselves, I started from the Victorian archives. As with the British Library collection for Southwark, this shows their huge value and the fantastic quality of some of the 19th century research and recording. This time, our hero is JT Irvin, and unfortunately I don't have a picture of him. Uh, the Cathedral Clerk of Works, firstly under Gigi, uh, George Gilbert Scott and then under J.L. Pearson, a successive architects for the cathedral. M many, many of the stones that I identified at uh, this method won't make it into the Anglo-Saxon corpus. Uh, and that's either because they relate not to 1066, a key date in the history of the nation, but to 1116, a key date in the material history of the Benedictine Abbey or they're not sufficiently sculptural. It's well known that Peterborough was one of the very last great churches to be rebuilt after the, the conquest, a consequence of both the political leanings of the monks and the imposition of a particularly unsympathetic Norman abbot, who was also unfortunately long lived. Only by the early 12th century had the rebuilding begun in some of the cloistral buildings, while the rebuilding of the church had to await a fortuitous fire in 1116 caused by the abbot rashly cursing the monastery and commending it to the devil. Uh, so this is a bit of a common medieval theme perhaps, but two years later the abbot laid the foundation of the new Romanesque Abbey Church that we still see today. So on the one hand, we have this clear documentary evidence, and on the other, we have the records of Irvin with his careful notes showing the discovery of all types of masonry and even parts of the late Anglo-Saxon church itself, the last Anglo-Saxon church beneath, below the present cathedral. This was made possible by the parlous condition of the cathedral in the 19th century. Unfortunately, this was accompanied by an equally parlous financial condition in, in the mid 19th century. Nothing changes, hey? So the repairs had to wait. Fortunately for us, uh, Pearson, the, the architect, continued to employ J.T. Irvin as clerk of works. And he, he was well known as an antiquary of some standing, not just in his native Shetland, but at many of the cathedrals and monuments where he worked. And the vast majority of the cathedral stone assemblage was found during the substantial repairs that began with the taking down and then rebuilding of the central tower uh, from its pinnacles to its foundations. It was taken down 1883 to four uh, and then rebuilt. And this was followed by extensive underpinning of both transepts. Thus the, uh, the assemblage stratigraphically predates the Norman church. So this slide uh, from VCH uh, shows the relationship of the last Anglo-Saxon church here uh, to the Norman building. And it also uh, conveniently shows the very long time it took to get from the apse here in 1116 to 18 to the west, the west front uh, in the which was only completed in the 1220s. 
that right up to this point here, it's all in a, a mostly Romanesque style. So I won't bore you with here with all the many reasons why the pre-Norman church stone assemblage all predates 1116, rather than predating the different building periods of the new church building, but just allude to key evidence that relates on the one hand to the building of the nave aisle south wall, that's here, at the very beginning of the building sequence, and on the other hand to the discovery of a few Anglo-Saxon architectural details in the foundations at the east end, including the apse. In other words, the whole, there's good evidence to suppose that the whole Anglo-Saxon church must have been taken down before the new church was laid out. Now I want to turn to Irvin's archaeological records and show just how good they are. They're why we can have some faith in identifying most of the pre-Norman church stones, including several in-situ grave covers and grave markers. Irvin's understanding of archaeology can be seen in both his published and unpublished papers on the discoveries of Peterborough and many unpublished drawings and notes in the cathedral archives. This is just one uh, which in black and white was actually published and so in red you can see uh, what he found of the Anglo-Saxon church and dotted is where he thought the East End was. There's a lot of other uh, drawing in there too. And, and here is one which is really quite uh, complicated um, and you know <laughs> From a modern archaeological drawing, it's a rather different, it took me a while to get my head around it. But here, this is part, only part, of the foundations of the crossing pier above. And this drawing was made when it was beginning to be, uh, the foundations were beginning to be removed in preparation for the underpinning. And so now we would have a really thick, dark line here to show that this was in a completely different plane from all these, uh, layers that can be seen behind uh, the, the uh, behind the excavations and behind the crossing pier. And it also shows uh, rather nicely uh, the one the positions of one of the Anglo-Saxon grave covers as this fits very well uh, with its written description. So then here's a, a another which uh, is from the underpinning of the south transept south wall. And here we can see that the coffins here, here, um, are very low level compared with the, uh, the Norman church. And one of them in fact is slightly underneath the foundations. And I think it's fair to assume that the carved coffin covers were intended for display, uh, which is possible if they were related to the last Anglo-Saxon church, which is a few feet below the Romanesque building. Uh, what have we got here? Here are another two drawings. And I've included these two just to show the care he took both in drawing fragments and recording where they came from. At the top of the left hand drawing, Irvin tells us that the stone was found during underpinning of the gable wall of the south transept and lower down, that the color was very strong when first discovered but has greatly faded. He also notes that the stone may be Saxon in date but thinks that the painting is Norman. And these are all wonderful observations and easy to tell what he saw from what he thinks. On the right hand of the drawing, he simply tells us that the stone was found under the northwest, uh, that's sorry, the right hand drawing, the northwest pier of the crossing, which I've already shown you. Using Irvin is not entirely unproblematic. There are things that he did not record uh, and and for which there are stones uh, which he for which no drawing as appear and, for, and some for which no published account appears. There are clear biases in what's published and unpublished. Skeletons are barely mentioned and never drawn. Uh, fragments found early on in the excavations are much more likely to have a published drawn record than those found later on. Um, probably because he had a day job and as the finds mounted, the significance of a single item must have been seen as less. He was also more concerned with the architecture of the church and especially the in situ foundations than he was with the memorials. However, because of the excellence of Irvin's unpublished papers, the Irvin papers in the Cathedral Library, uh, a selection of papers held in the Northamptonshire Record Office and a very important little diary held at uh, Cambridge University Library, 
These biases, apart from the lack of bodies, can largely be accounted for. Um, I'm just going to take a look at one group of pre-1116 material very briefly. So I'm going to be ignoring sculpture like this and architectural stone like this and instead concentrate on the cemetery. Um, so the cemetery, I think, is a particular interest uh, because nearly all the material was largely found in situ. And to start with, uh, oh, sorry, here we are, some in situ material. Um, OK, so to start with. Um, da, 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 da. I'm losing my place. I was busily uh, deleting slides because it went on far too long. So if I go to here, uh, you'll see that the um, I've deleted one slide too many, so I'll go back in a moment. Uh, this shows uh, the areas of, uh, where the late uh, 19th century structural work and underpinning took place, and it's clearly a strip in the middle. So it's the crossing and the transepts. And so this is where the archaeological discoveries were also made. Um, and we can, uh, um, we can see that the cemetery in 1116 was actually quite a long way north uh, of the church, which is here. Um, and it, we can imagine that it was populated not only by some memorials, but also by monuments such as carved crosses and the head of stone, um, both of which you will have seen extremely fleetingly. Um, we've got a few basic subsets. Uh, I shall leave this one up. Some of the stones, the interlaced ones, um, more obviously Anglo-Saxon, um, including two here, which one of which you've already seen found near the Northwest Crossing. Um, and then there's this very interesting group here, um, which is found on the interior of the North Transept uh, during underpinning in 1889. And with a rather dramatically cut, so if I go back, we get a picture of it, here we are, rather dramatically cut by the foundations of the North Transept West Wall. Um, the interlacer two of them rather suggest they're late Saxon, while the remaining three completely plain are surely Saxon by association. Irvin makes a point of telling us that there were no coffins. Alas, we do not know what he did with the bones below, so there's no possibility of testing to see if these closely associated covers re represent a familial group or not. Um, we can also see that two of the stones have in situ footstones, I and mean, doubtless they also had headstones. The footstone of the cover with the inhabited cross was rediscovered only a few years ago, uh, where it was found to be a reused Roman ansate slab. And, and thanks to Richard Gemma and, and um, Martin Hennig for that. Um, and here's a summary of the situation. Here we are so far. Now I want to add to this whole group of stones that were actually a, a group that was actually found some distance away by me in 2005, reused in a wall of Commonwealth date next to the old deanery. And they're a mixture of um, grave covers or, or possibly coffin cover fragments. And um, this shows four grave covers and one of the upright markers. And this one shows the remaining five upright markers. None of them are closely dated. Most could plausibly be 11th century. And together they exhibit a mixture of pre and post conquest uh, design elements, sometimes on the same stone. And the fact that this fairly coherent group stayed together to be rediscovered, uh, reused in a 17th century wall, suggests that they were all reused uh, together in the, the first place. Uh, and I've argued elsewhere that they were reused probably in the Lady Chapel, which was taken down in the Commonwealth period uh, to save money, basically, because they couldn't look after the whole building. It was at that stage in use, the cathedral was in that stage in use as a parish church. And the final principal group uh, is of coffins and, and coffin covers. Uh, this is a tiny one, only just only over two foot long, uh, but I don't know exactly where it came from, Poss probably the North Transept. And, and then there's the group of um, in situ coffins and coffin covers. Here's two of the four surviving in the Victorian crypt that allows us to access the Anglo-Saxon church foundations today. Urban saw a little more of them than we can now. The altitude clearly had covers, flat or barely coped with a single central ridge. 
Six more were found in the South Transept chapels in Irvin's Hunts for the East End of the Saxon Church. And at the south end of the South Transept, five further coffins were found, I'm sure I'm only showing you two here, of which two were built and three carved from a single stone. And one had coffin had two covers, not sure why. In all these cases, the pre-1116 date is confirmed by the depth of the coffins or, or their strat clear stratigraphic relationship. And although a one-to-one -one identification may elude us, it's likely that some of the coffin and coffin cover group can be identified with, with the ones that, that now lie uh, east of the south transept. And here's a sort of summary of the situation. Uh, in green, uh, that's the coffins and in uh, coffins and coffin covers. And in pink, it's um, memorials only. So just, just, coffin, just grave covers. And it's quite interesting that the clearly Anglo-Saxon examples um, are actually all to the north and actually quite far from the uh, Anglo-Saxon church itself, showing that it was a large uh, and rather popular well-used cemetery. Um, whereas um, at the, the group, the coffins themselves are gathered around the, Ang the last Anglo-Saxon church itself, which is quite interesting. One wonders if a number uh, of earlier memorials were turfed out to make room. Um, so, uh, it, and it's what's very interesting, I think, about this is certainly conventional to consider that the widespread production of coffins belongs to the post conquest period. And given the paucity of pre conquest coffins at other sites, it's at least legitimate to consider that the Peaceborough coffins are also post conquest. And this would lead to two conclusions. First, that this is the largest and most tightly dated assemblage of early coffins in the country. And secondly, if this is true, there's a major change in burial practice pre and post conquest. I don't think this is too circular of an argument, though it may be, uh, with the burials of the elites gathered tightly around the church in the later 11th century and found in coffins, but with those coffins carved with considerably less decorative flair than their predecessors. So I hope you can at least see something of the potential of this material, far more work to do on it. And so, uh, and just before ending, I just want to um, comment and bring, and uh, talk about very briefly, um, a, a little, a tiny, tiny watching brief at Southwark uh, for, the, for a new ramp. And at the same time as that happened, uh, the prior's door just around the corner uh, was cleaned. So um, this, so you can see from here with the uh, handy cathedral cat as a scale, what a very small area this is. And uh, just next to the cat is, is a very, very small inspection hole left for uh, us by Arthur Blomfield uh, in the 1890s, uh, which revealed um, some, uh, some tiles at, at the end of the tile floor. And when this, um, the, the current floor was taken up to make a ramp, uh, these be this became more obvious. In the first place, we could see a, a step uh, here and a bunch of tiles butted against it, um, all reused, dating from the 14th century to the into the 16th century, only one decorative one. So clearly a, um, bits of pavement reused to make a new floor in, in, at some unspecified post-medieval period. Um, but even more interesting, um, from there was really a ton of archaeology, and what surprised me, it was really stupid, you know, foundations under, under arch, who would have guessed it? Um, but these foundations here, which are of the 12th, uh, re relate to the 12th century building, uh, uh, are 76 centimetres above the level of the medieval nave floor, thus conclusively proving that despite that uh, the level of the north transept is approximately at the medieval level, um, uh, which is something I really doubted because of the uh, really substantial um, restorations and rebuildings it's been subject to. Um, and what was particularly interesting, we've got a whole bunch of um, deposits here. So we've got 12th century a sleeper foundation here. 
here cutting through this is um, the foundations of, of the late 14th century um, crossing tower, which actually puts to bed a theory, uh, not all of a theory, half of a theory about the crossing tower um, actually having a Romanesque core, um, at, but it, it seems clear that it was completely taken down and rebuilt from the base up. Though I dare say that the Romanesque crossing tower is responsible was responsible for the slightly odd proportions of the early Gothic uh, choir and nave. Also of considerable interest is this. This, by the way, is all modern, but this is, is, the, is the dark earth, uh, that, that well-known post-Roman deposit that here, I'm sure, must indicate the level of natural topography when the Priory was founded in the early 12th century. And what's particularly interesting and sort of surprising about it is this, uh, I'm pretty sure this is the highest recorded level locally, though this requires more investigation. It falls off very sharply on the west side. You can't quite see it, it's the other side of here. Um, and um, which makes sense of this bit. Um, the foundation here is typically sort of uh, earth and, and stone rammed together. Uh, whereas the western edge is mortared because it has to hold up because the ground is falling steeply off to the west, which makes sense of the, the much lower um, medieval nave floor. And it almost certainly continued uh, rising to the east where the, uh, the choir is at a really substantially higher level again. So we can have this impression very much of um, though things are relative, we're only still talking a few metres above sea level, uh, of a, a church really standing on a hill um, with, with the overlooking the Thames to the north and London Bridge uh, to the east. Um, and uh, that was really very interesting. Uh, I, and at the same time, as I say, the, the uh, uh, yes, sorry, and also, yes, we also got architectural detail. So we've got detail what appears to be the early 12th century church underneath and behind the late 13th century post fire uh, rebuilding of the transept, um, where it just sort of cantilevered over the 12th century uh, foundations as, um, as opposed to the, the way it's dealt with in, in the crossing tower on the other side. And you just get these plain, you get these sort of plain rebates here uh, for, for a, a sort of simple arch over. But just around the, around the corner, um, um, this is the uh, prior's doorway and you, it's almost impossible, it's enclosed in a tiny, tiny space, almost impossible to get a decent picture. It's um, late 12th century, uh, so pre-fire, um, and in fact, it's got fire damage on it. Um, and this is, it, and it was completely black. And so the cleaning by Skill Skillingtons was a, you know, a sort of miraculous, or it's seemingly, uh, as it, the architectural detail uh, emerged uh, fr from this horrible black stuff. And adjacent to it on, on the, in the wall of the transept is a stoop, a holy water stoop next to it. And we thought, and, we're and again, my friend Kevin Hayward um, was happy to confirm for me that the stoop, um, now it's clean, is, is of Tournay marble. And this was really immensely interesting um, because uh, Tournay is most famously used in this country for, for the Tournay marble fonts of the 12th century, imported from uh, what's now Belgium. Um, highly carved, highly decorative. And, you know, this use of marble for holy water seems uh, very significant. And uh, some, some of the, a subset of these fonts um, were, uh, seem to be the direct uh, result of patronage of, of the bishops of Winchester. And uh, that is also true, as many of you will know, of St. the Priory of St. Mary Overy itself, it's in the diet, it was in the Diocese of Winchester. Winchester Palace is just next door uh, and various bishops um, are documented to actually having paid for various elements of, of, of the building of, of the Priory. Um, 
And so, you, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind making a, a moderately sized bet if I were a betting woman that uh, perhaps the, the, um, the, the Priory actually had one of these uh, marvellous, hang on, my, uh, uh, sorry, had actually had one of these marvellous fonts um, this is the one at Winchester Cathedral itself. Um, uh, and though this is a little earlier than, than our stoop, um, you, you can imagine how marvellous that would be. And so, um, and this slightly uh, oddly using a, a slide from Winchester and not from either Peterborough or Southwark uh, brings me to the end of my talk. And I've I feel I've barely scratched the surface of each of these studies, so I may have bored you. Um, and you can see, I hope you can see something of the value and complexity of cathedral archaeology uh, and whether that's going to be found above ground or below ground or in dusty archives or very, very tiny watching briefs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackie. That was fantastic. Um, I'm not going to ask whether the uh, the ending on Winchester is a punt for a new cathedral to add to your collection. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, no, that, that was really interesting. And I think what your talk did was show how varied the job of a cathedral archaeologist is. I mean, partly part of it's out of your control. It's whatever's going on. And but it's the fact you're dealing with building fabric below ground archaeology and then getting some research done as well. So, I mean, it really shows the complexity of the job um, that perhaps isn't always apparent uh, to, to people. So that was really great. I really enjoyed that. Um, I know we, we have some questions. <clears throat> Um, I know there's at least one pressing cat question coming up. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so, but um, if anyone still would like to ask a question, if you could type it into the chat box, and um, we should have uh, time to get to it. So, um, Rob, do we have one to, to kick off with? I appreciate time is a little tight. No, that's good. We do. We've got a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, uh, there are reg legendary references to the early foundation of the church at Suffolk, and it appears to be mentioned in Doomsday. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, well, I, I'm ashamed to say I'm a bit of a need to know archaeologist, and uh, this isn't something I have. Um, it's also something I've been trying to avoid beca because the references seem so ephemeral. However, um, and the, the Anglo-Saxon reference is in is alluded to in a 17th century book on London, one of the surveys of London. Um, so uh, at first I sort of slightly poo-pooed this idea, but in a discussion that I had with Richard Jen uh, a, a while back, he made the, the very apropos point that uh, if it were not an, a very early foundation, why did it occupy this immensely important strategic position next to um, London Bridge? And um, I, and I'm I, I thought yes, I think you're right. And and now you know I've now seen that it's actually on a hill as well next to London. The the you know the only crossing, uh, the only medieval crossing, um, whether bridge or or ferry crossing. You know um, I suspect that that really is the case actually. Okay, I think we've just got, uh, well, <laughs> there is the cathedral cat question, uh, is are there any other cathedral cats? Are they common? <laughs> I know there's, I know there's one at Durham, I've seen one at Durham. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the vergers at Southwark say there's lots of cathedral cats, but there's only one that actually lives in the cathedral and is looked after just by the vergers. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> There's one, one last question, which I think is a good one. It says, why don't modern restorations bypass Victorian work to uncover the original cathedral? Um, well, in the case of Southwark, there wouldn't be anything left. Um, you know, the, the stone has just completely decayed. You know, let's not do it. Um, and it would go absolutely against a modern, and that's really a question for an architect, I should say, not for an archeologist. Um, but that really goes against modern conservation philosophy, that you don't uh, 
there, I mean, there are rare occasions when you get rid of, um, oh, I don't know, the 19th century um, coal shed or something like that. Um, but you, you, the restorations themselves are part of the, the history and archaeology of these buildings. And they were done for a reason. Uh, they, they weren't, um, although they were often over restored, if they have been over restored, there won't be anything medieval left anyway. And, but these restorations started um, because the buildings were falling down, you know. Uh, yeah. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Right, sorry. I think both Rob and myself are trying to unmute me, so we kept, we're playing the game of muting each other. Um, so, well, thank, thank you very much, Jackie, and I would just like to lead a virtual round of applause for you. So, thank you very much. Um, I just want to say, right just for the, the end, uh, just to give you notice of our next lecture, <coughs> which is taking place in a month's time on the 5th of April, it's not the 5th of April, 5th of May, um, and that's by Dr Michael Carter, who's going to be talking on the topic of Byland Abbey using dead to bring a monastery to life. So that sounds uh, very intriguing. Um, but um, in the meantime, I'd like you to thank you all for attending. Um, we really do appreciate it. I'd like to thank our speaker one final time, and I hope you can join us all, you know, same time next month. Thank you. <laughs>